Hi, this is Robin. Just want to say thank you to everybody who's been subscribing and liking the videos and everybody who watched past a thousand subscribers now. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Just want to say thank you to Logiker for making that awesome directory that inspired the video and also to my friend Jason Compton who mentioned it. By the way, speaking of Jason, just want to point out there's a magazine called Commodore World that was published by CMD, the makers of the Super CPU and lots of other cool hardware. And this was actually the first issue I ever received from them. Issue 15 here in the columns, just for starters, by Jason Compton. And while we're looking at this Commodore World magazine, this actually ran from about 1994 to 1999, uh, after the demise of Run, uh, Computes Gazette, all those were, were gone by then in the later 90s. And on the back is this uh, funny super CPU ad. 20 megahertz on a C64? Sure. When pigs fly. And there's this very interesting prototype picture of it. And here's a user enjoying their very loaded Commodore 128 system here with a super CPU. Starting at $199. I bet a lot of people wish they could buy a super CPU brand new for $199 right now. And in other news, my friend Ducky Virus set up a GitHub repository called 8-Bit Show and Tell. I'll put a link down below. This is like an unofficial repository where he's gone through, typed in the code examples from some of my past episodes, and you can download them, check them out there. Just say it's unofficial because I don't really have anything to do with it other than just I gave him my permission and uh, he's doing that. But it's definitely a, a cool project and uh, check out what he's done there. Okay, today I want to talk about another cartridge. You know, I'm always going on about the Super Snapshot here, my beat up old Super Snapshot that I love a lot. But there are other utility cartridges out there. The Action Replay is a great one. Perhaps the the first or certainly the most popular and the one that's actually still really easy to get today is the Epix Fast Load and I happen to have a boxed copy of it right here. It's a little bit beat up but it's complete in box. Loads discs five times faster, works with most popular programs and it's easy to use. No slow hippos. It was born slow. A lumbering hippo. Insulting my disk drive, eh? Open it up here. This is hardly in mint condition, but I think it is complete. Here's the actual cartridge. Epix fast load. The tray. And it comes with a catalog from winter 1984. Showing what Epix was selling. Hey, there's the receipt. Canadian tire. Ah, it was actually bought in 1985 for 40 bucks. Canadian. I'm going to use some coupons. How about that? And it's showing a bunch of the games that are available at that time. What's my favorite there? There's Sword of Fargo. That's a great one. Jumpman Jr., one of my all-time favorite C64 games. Impossible Mission. My friend Darren and I did an episode of our show, Growing Up 80s, our favorite games on the C64 Mini. These ended up being some of them. I'll, I'll put a link to that video down below. It's on, on our other channel. Okay, and the main thing here is this Fast load cartridge instruction manual. On the back, it shows new Epix games that work with the fast load cartridge. It's actually only a two page leaflet here, but amazing, it's extremely dense. There's all kinds of functionality in here. So, the fast load cartridge, obviously, as the name indicates, its primary function, or at least the reason its main marketing thrust, was that it loads things faster. And a lot of that is because the Commodore 64 had a famously slow disk drive, the 1541, uh, a series of kind of goof-ups, bugs, mistakes were made from the VIC-20, the Commodore 64, that resulted in the 1541 being unnecessarily slow. Fortunately, there were a number of ways to fix that just through software, and the fast load cartridge was maybe not the best, but certainly one of the most popular, probably the most popular, solution to this problem. And it did a whole bunch of other things too beyond that. But first we'll look at the fast load functionality. In the manual here, getting started, make sure set up your Commodore 64, make sure your computer's off, insert the fast load cartridge, turn the computer on. Strangely, I tell you turn the disk drive on after the computer, and I believe that's contrary to the advice Commodore gives. 
In fact, I've got here the Commodore 1541 Disk Drive User's Guide on page 6. There's the section powering on, and they specifically say when you have all the devices hooked together, it's time to start turning on the power in bold. It is important that you turn on the devices in the correct order. The computer should always be turned on last. As long as the computer is the last one to be turned on, everything will be okay. <laughs> Which is kind of a funny statement, everything will be okay. It's exactly contradictory to what the Epix uh, fast load guide is saying, so I don't know. And then insert your program disk. Note, there is no need to remove the fast load cartridge once inserted. I'll think it's actually 100% true. Okay, so I'm just going to plug in the fast load cartridge here. So plug it in and switch it on. What? I've never seen that before. Let's try that again. Oh, whoo, good. What was up with that? Okay, so the first thing you notice when you turn on the computer with the fast load cartridge in is that it says fast load, and that indicates it's active. And let's give it a try. Commercial programs that support the fast load cartridge actually aren't that plentiful. Well, at least it works with a lot of games, but it doesn't load them, it does actually speed them up a lot, because a lot of games have their own loaders built into it, and the fast load cartridge isn't going to help there. So it took me a while, I found this Mastertronic BMX Racer, and this one really does speed it up quite a bit. So we'll try it with the fast load cartridge, as we'll try it with it enabled first. So excuse my iPad here, I'm just going to use it to time. One other advantage to almost all utility cartridges is that they have keyboard shortcuts, that also speed up things a lot over typing in the long basic commands that are built into the C64. I can actually just hit Commodore and run stop. It'll automatically load the first file on the disk drive. So let's try that. I'm going to hit the start button on the timer at the same time. I'm just going to skip those. Okay, so about 31 seconds there to load this game. BMX Racers isn't a great game, by the way, but I bought it for 10 bucks at Zeller's. Mastertronic was great for kids without much money to be able to buy an okay game. Okay, I'm going to restart the computer. And now to disable the cartridge, I could turn off the computer, but there's a built-in way. You press the pound key, well, the British pound key. It enters this menu, and we'll look at this a bit more later, but first we'll hit D for disable fast load. And now it's a stock Commodore 64. Reset the time. And notice I have to type in the long load command here, and I'll press start. Now you might not know this little trick. If I don't do this, I'm going to have to take time to type run while that command on the fast load, the Commodore run stop, actually does it automatically. But if I press Commodore run stop now after typing in this command with the fast load disabled, it'll actually do the typing of run for me later. So here I'll go ahead and do that. So you see it's put load on the screen there afterwards. But I automatically typed run. Okay, and we'll skip those again, just like before. And so this is it loading without the fast load cartridge. We'll let it go. This is going to take quite a bit longer than the 30 seconds. I'm going to fast forward this part. There we go. One minute, 41 seconds. So that was over three times faster with the fast load cartridge than without it. So obviously it speeds up some things. Where it's most useful is actually when you're just loading your own files that you've saved, like a large basic program, or if you've 
got some games that have been cracked and pirated, and they're, you know, they, the protection is being removed, and they're just single PRG files, they'll load those much quicker. So that's where all utility cartridges, such as Fastload and other ones, they really shine when there's no software loaders involved. Now I'll point out that Fastload had quite a good advertising campaign. Here's an issue of Run Magazine, May 1985, and right inside the front cover is this guy. Tired of waiting forever for your programs to load? I remember my friends, friends and I thinking that was hilarious that his screen said, still loading. And it's interesting that he's got a stack of games here that are all slow loaders, I guess. Summer Games, Load Runner and Flight Simulator from other companies. Then the baseball game, Pit Stop. He's had a bunch of cans of Coke. He's eating food and he's quite dismayed. Introducing the fast load cartridge from Epix. So anyway, that, that was quite an advertising campaign and probably quite effective. I, I heard that they sold hundreds of thousands of copies of this cartridge, but you know, I don't know how we could ever verify that. But if so, this might be one of the best selling C64 programs, cartridges of all time maybe the best. And that also reminds me, I was saying it's easy for you to get a fast load cartridge, and I, I do recommend it if the price is right. It's a handy thing to use on your real Commodore. And if you can't get an original one, you can actually, from the future was 8-bit, on his website, he's selling them with a, a really nice cartridge. It's called Fast Load Reloaded, and it's a somewhat improved version of the cartridge and so check that out and there's probably other people selling clones of it as well but like i was saying there's a lot of other things that the fast load cartridge has built in let's go through a few of those features one of the biggest ones is that it has a built-in what we call a dos wedge which is a bunch of easy instructions that simplify disk usage on the C64 because what was built into Commodore Basic 2 was really pretty poor, very poor. <laughs> One of the most useful things is that you can just press dollar sign, hit return, and it will stream the directory for, for you. Not only does that save you some time, on regular Commodore Basic, the only way of seeing what was on the disk was to load it into memory. With this command, load dollar sign comma eight, and then you list it. So the problem with that, it's a destructive load, meaning whatever you had in memory at the time is gone. So that was especially annoying if you were programming your computer at the time, and then you wanted to save your program, but you're trying to remember what file name would you use next or, or whatever, <laughs> you couldn't access that information from the disk drive without losing the program you had in memory. For example, so if I have a program, if I was to load dollar sign comma eight, that would erase that program. Now, just for this example, imagine I've typed a few screens worth of code in, I don't want to lose it. But when you do the dollar sign, by the way, this is just a random disk I had lying around. This is the fast hack I used last episode. Okay, but if I list my program, it's still there, doing that non-destructive directory. Nowadays, I think we'd call it streaming it from the disk. It's very handy. Yeah, by the way, almost every command on the C64, you can slightly abbreviate by typing the first letter. This is list. If you type L and then shift I, shift the second letter, it shows it to you. I know it's only saving one keystroke, but these are habits I picked up when I was a kid. And, uh, well, anyway, <laughs> I still do it. I already showed you that Commodore Run Stop shortcut. You can load most files. So, for example, if you want to load a program named File, then you would just do a slash and hit Enter. I don't think there's actually one called that on disk. If you want to save your program, you can just go back arrow. I won't hit Return on that. By the way, I'll hit Shift Return which is like a way of escaping from it. For example, if we load file comma eight and load file comma eight comma one, some of you might not know what the difference is between those two commands. Loading file comma eight is what you do if you want to load a program into memory at the beginning of basic. Loading comma eight comma one signifies that you want to load the program into memory wherever it was saved from. 
when that program was saved, it could be anywhere in memory. It could be up high at C1000, it could be at 8000, or it could be down at regular Commodore Basic 0801. It will load it into that original location. So comma 8 is a relocating load, and comma 8 comma 1 is a non-relocating load. And on most wedges, slash file corresponds to loading with comma 8, and percent sign file corresponds to comma 8 comma 1. You can also type the at symbol to send a command to the disk drive. So command I sends the initialize command to the drive. And then you can get the status back. What automatically showed it there is hit the at symbol and it shows that the last operation was okay. On some wedges, such as this one, Super Snapshot, you can also use the greater than symbol to do the same thing. I actually got in the habit of using the greater than symbol because I thought it looked, it worked on my Super Snapshot and I thought it looked a little cooler. I don't know, it looked like a prompt on like a DOS machine. I don't know what's cool about that, I, I'm not sure. And what that typing either that is a shorthand for typing this really annoying open 15 comma 8 comma 15 quote sending the command and then close 15. Even if fast load cartridge or any other utility cartridge didn't speed up disk access, I think having this built-in command wedge alone is worth it. Okay, so those are all the basic wedge commands that are built in. Now, as we briefly looked at before, there's another menu you can access just by typing the, the pound symbol, if we're going to call it that, or the... Now, this has some confusion. I don't know people start calling that one the pound as well. But anyway, this is the, the GBP the Great Britain Pound. Okay, so we press that, and it brings up the first menu. That's kind of an amusing title for it. And we can do things like press A for the directory, press space to continue, F1 to abort. F1. Okay, we can press B to return to basic, C to copy, and here you can copy one disk to another, or copy a single file. There's also this option D, BAM copy. Last episode we looked at the BAM. This reads the BAM and only copies sectors and tracks that are marked as used. So the, the end result is it's a faster copy. It's not a complete copy, but if the BAM has been updated properly, the block availability map has been updated correctly, it'll copy everything you need. All the rest of the sectors are empty. Press B to go back. Now option D is to disable fast load. That's what we looked at before. And option E is to edit the diskette. That's actually a track and sector editor like we were using last episode. That's part of why I thought I would do that this time. But first I just want to show you. Go to go back to basic. In case you didn't see it last episode, we looked at an animated directory and uh, created one. So here, let's look at that now. This is the one I made. See how the text is scrolling in there. So that's the disk from last time. And my friend Darren asked me to do a trick with that. And I thought this would be a perfect opportunity. Edit the diskette. So you see it's asking what track do you want to load in hex. And track 12 hex, 18 decimal. And it's strange that defaults to sector 2. I would expect it to default to sector 0, which is where the BAM and the name is. Or sector 1, where the directory listing starts. I do not know why the default is sector 2. If you do know, leave a comment, please. We'll go to sector 1. And now it shows it here with a hex display. And over on the right, it shows a representation of that character. We can scroll down. So basically it's two pages worth because it, it's only fitting 128 bytes per screen and there's 256 bytes in the block. We'll follow the chain through here. We want to go to track 12, sector 4. I should have explained this. Up in the, the first two bytes here, 12 and 7, indicate the next block in the directory. So we want to go, we're currently at 12, 4, as you can see in the top right corner, but we want to go to 12, 7, and now we're followed to 12a, read 12a. It'd be nice if they had that little jump feature that Fast Hackam had. 
And then next is 12D, 12D. And now you see this one, the link is to 00FF. That indicates we're at the end of the directory. This is what Darren wanted me to do. He wanted to make an endless, endlessly looping directory. So we're going to point the directory. This is the end of the directory. We're going to point it back to the beginning, which is at track 12, sector 1. So that's in memory. And now we're going to write it to memory. And 12, fortunately, it remembers the track and sector you're currently on. Okay, now we're going to quit, back to basic, and now we'll do a directory and let's see if that worked. 8-bit, show and tell, and there we go. So this is an infinite program. It's forever looping back on itself, or an infinite directory, but it's also like a, a program. It's an endless file that loops back on itself. This is normally a bad idea. It's going to wear out the disk or wear out the computer or whatever, so I won't actually leave it running. And actually we can go back in and let's fix that. Let's go to track 12D and we're going to set that back. Instead of looping back to 12.1, we're going to go to 00FF and we're going to write that back. Now we'll quit and whoops, and we'll do the directory. And one last menu we have here, we're going to go into the file utility. And again, we can do directory, we can return to the menu, copy a file, delete a file. Now this is, this one's the most interesting, lock and unlock a file. So let's do a directory and let's see a file name. Okay, there's one called boot. We're back on the fast hackam disk. Okay, so file, E to lock a file. It's called boot. Now we'll do a directory. You see how there's a right arrow next to boot? It's scrolling away there. So for this case, I'm going to load the directory and we'll list the beginning of it. You see, this wasn't here before. The file is currently locked, so it has this arrow next to it. And that prevents the file from being scratched. So we'll do a scratch command, which is just the wedge symbol S boot. It says one file scratched and let's look at it. it. Says it scratched it. Let's look. I'll load dollar sign again. Instead of streaming it, we can load it. And you see boot is still there. We did not scratch it. So we'll go back in to the file utility and we will unlock a file boot go back to basic load the directory list and you see now is no longer there so let's try scratching that file boot one scr file scratched the reason I'm loading instead of streaming the disk is that this is a long disk and I don't want to watch the whole thing scroll every time. And look, boot is gone. It's gone. How do we get back? With the sector editor. Let's go back in. Edit disk. We'll go to 12.1. And you see here, on the right side, this is the ASCII for B-O-O. -O. It says boo over there and T. When you scratch a file, it still exists. File type gets marked as a zero. Let's enter that in. 82 is for a regular PRG file, and I'll bring the file back to life. Let's write it to 12.1. Quit. Turn to basic. Okay, and we'll stream it. You see now boot is back again. I noticed that the fast load Cartridge does not let you break out of a directory. Super Snapshot lets you hit stop so you don't have to scroll through the whole thing each time. Okay, so there's the boot file. Actually, I want to check something. File utility, lock a file, 
We're going to lock boot. Now we're going to go back and we're going to edit the diskette and we're going to load 12.1. And interestingly, it changed the program type from 8.2 to C2. So that's setting another bit. That's interesting. So let's go ahead and try to make some of these other files locked as well. Changing them to C2. We're going to write that. We'll quit. Return to basic. Load dollar sign. And now if that worked, the first three files will be locked. And they are. They've all got the less than symbol. Why didn't I call it that in the first place? And I just realized it's March break for kids. In 1984, 35 years ago, is when I bought my Commodore 64, my first Commodore. Uh, we drove down to Duluth, Minnesota, and went to the Target there. I was going to buy a VIC-20, but my parents said, you should buy this newer computer instead. And they were right. Here's a picture just later in that year. When I first bought the 64, I did not have... A disk drive. In fact, I didn't even have a cassette drive. I just had the 64 hooked up to that black and white TV you see there. A few weeks later, probably in April sometime, I bought a data set, a, the cassette drive. I believe it was $40 at Zeller's. Late that year, in October, for my birthday, my parents paid for half of the disk drive, and I paid for the other half with money from my paper route. So there you go, blast from the past 35 years ago. Right now, I've had the 64, and I never quit using some sort of 8-bit Commodore ever since then. I still have that missing link in the back there, too. Okay, we're just going to look at the machine language modder now built into the Epix fast load. It's fairly powerful, but also quite quirky. The modder I've been using in the Super Snapshot in previous episodes, I, I certainly prefer. And it's also the same lineage as Supermon for the pet, which was then ported by Jim Butterfield to the VIC-20, to the Commodore 64, and even the modder that's built into the Commodore 128, I believe, has some association with that whole Supermon line of monitors. <laughs> but the one in the Epix fast load is not. It's It's got very different syntax, but we're gonna take a look at it. It's still an interesting thing to explore, and it's it can be useful to you. If that's what you have, and you wanna work on a real 64, and you have a fast load cartridge, then it's perfectly good for doing some experiments. So the way we enter the monitor is to just type an exclamation mark and return. And that dot prompt shows that we're in the monitor. And you can exit out again just by typing a percentage. Now we're back in. Doing a star C1000 shows the memory at that location. And right now it's sort of filled with garbage. And one shortcoming of the fast load monitor is that it doesn't have an assembler built in. So if you want to write a little assembly program, you're going to have to do that by hand, but we're going to do a very short example today. So to enter something into memory, this is the same program we did some episodes ago, which is just changing the border color rapidly. So you can enter a program into memory, such as, yeah, I'm just going to put it in at C1000, a colon, and then you just type your opcode. EE is for the increment. Grab your C64 programmer's reference guide, and around page... 243 and we're doing the absolute version of it which is opcode ee so we type in ee and then the address that we want to increase which is d020 in low byte high byte format so that's why we put the 20 first and then the d0 after that is the address of the border color in the vic2 so that's our first command. And then we just want to do a jump command, which is 4C. Can look that up just on the very next page. Jump to new location. Absolute is opcode 4C. And again, it's three bytes. The first byte is the opcode. And the next two bytes you can think of as the parameter. And we just want to jump back to C1000. Again, low byte high byte and press return. That's entered into memory. And now we can make sure that it looks correct by using the L command. Okay, well, that was a full screen. We could just do 
two values to just see a range of it. And there we go. Increment D020 and jump back to C1000. And now we can start the program with either J or G C1000. G begins execution of machine language code at location zero via JSR. What's going on is if you use the G instruction, it does a JSR which pushes the current program counter onto the stack and then begins execution. Or if you use J, it does a jump. It doesn't push the program counter on the stack before execution. In our case, it really doesn't matter. I'll just use the G. There you go. It's running that little program. I'll have a link down below to the full explanation of this code. And now this is a nice feature built in. If you hit the restore key, it actually stops the program and it shows the last line executed. It was the code at C1000, the increment D020. And then it shows your registers, the A, X, Y, the processor status, and the stack pointer. And now we can use the S command to single step, to step through the code. So if we type step, it executed the increment. And then if we step again, it executed the jump. And now when we step again, we're going to execute the code C1000 again, which will again increment the border color. So as soon as I hit this, it should increment there and so on. Every second step, it's going to change the border color because it's doing increment on one step and then it's doing the jump to C1000 on the next one. So as I was showing you, you can do a listing of the code. On other assemblers, this is the D command, disassemble. On this, it's L, I suppose, for list. Right, and now we can go up and change memory from this EE. Instead, if we change it to an 8 D and press return and then we list again. Unfortunately it doesn't update the disassembly at the right hand side there. There now it's changed. It used to be an increment. Now it's a store A. And now we're going to step. Make sure it starts at C thousand. Okay, and what's done now, the accumulator had zero in it, and so it stored that in DO20. So it just changed the border to color zero, which is black. Whoops. I pressed return where I shouldn't have, and it interpreted that as, that's the equals command, which actually gives the value in other bases and in ASCII. So <laughs> when I hit enter on this, it actually interpreted that as A equals, and that shows us A in hex is the same as 10 in decimal binary, and then it showed us the Petsky representation of that. It actually did it for all those different commands. Okay, back to our program. Okay, we want to step C1000. That changed the color to black. If we keep stepping though, all our program is doing now is storing zero repeatedly in the border. Well, that's a lot more boring than the increment we used to have there, but we can do something here. If we press that British pound key and press return. That shows us all the different registers. Uh, as we've been seeing every step, we can actually change them. If you press the pound, then every number that you put in after, the first number will change the accumulator. So let's try changing that to one. And if you want to change X, Y, P, or S, then you have to keep typing multiple numbers in. And Kind of strangely, you can't change like the X register without also changing the A register. It just works from the left to the right. So we're just going to change the accumulator. There, now you see the accumulator is equal to one. And now we're going to continue stepping. There, and now the border has turned white. And let's now put three in there and step twice. We'll do the jump. There, and now it's changed the border to cyan, color three. Okay, so that's how you can modify the registers in your program and continue executing. So you have a fair bit of control to experiment. If you want to write yourself little programs and play around with it, this is a very good way to learn using a machine language monitor like this. Now, a very strange quirk of the fast load monitor is the order you type the instructions in 
Sort of doesn't matter, but in the instruction book, they heavily encourage you to put the number first and then the command after, which is very different than Jim Butterfield's Supermon, uh, all the monitors derived from that. I've been trying to put it at the left. You usually can, but on this next command, it goes really badly. I'll show you what happens there. So if I want to save a file to disk, there's the right command. I'm going to just give it a file name like test. And then you put the range of addresses in again. Again, this is the wrong way to do it, but I'm just going to show you what happens. We want to save from location C1000 to C1005. That's six bytes. It's inclusive with this monitor. And then we want to save to device eight. So let's go ahead and do that. Now see how the cursor cha changed color? That is often a bad sign. And let's do a directory, just dollar sign return. It was just another disk I was using. And look at how messed up this directory is. Test, and then a bunch of blank lines, and then the number 8226 PRG. It interpreted these following bytes as part of the file name, but it still knew what to save. Actually, this this makes me think, back in the day, I used to see a lot of files on disks, like, you know, you'd, you'd copy somebody's disk, and there would be weird files on the end like this. And you know what? I bet they were from people using Epic's fast load, the save command, not quite right, because they weren't getting the quirkiness of it. Now I'll show you the correct way to do this. Instead, you type the range first, then the device number, then the right command. I'll call it test one just to differentiate it. Now let's do a directory. Okay, and there's a proper looking test one without any messed up stuff after. She just reminds me, I got one comment that from somebody who was finding the default C64 colors of light blue on dark blue, hard to read. I know that the 8-bit guy uses white text. He just does it when he turns on his computer, I believe. Uh, Control-2 to change to white. What do you people think? Are you finding it hard to view? So I want to show you just how to load that file back again. Uh, we'll look at memory at C1000. And you see there's our program right here. So we can actually fill memory. We type C1000 colon, you can actually put a quote and then you can just type in Petsky like hello world. And now we can look at C1000. Now you see over here on the right side, there is hello world. And now we can read in that file. C thousand eight R and it's R to read. In all the other monitors, it's L to load and S to save, but in this it's R and W read and write. And we'll load in test one. And it'll tell you the loading address, C thousand, and then the last byte it wrote. And now we should see that our program is back in memory. Yeah, and there it is. The store A and the jump back to C thousand. And you can see right after the pet ski for world is still there. We can list that as well. It's interesting, these addresses are inclusive. Most monitors use an exclusive end address. So you would actually have to type C1006 and it would do up to C1005. So I guess I like inclusive. You just have to know what you're dealing with. Oh, yeah, another thing we can do is load files to other addresses. You see how C100 is just full of full of junk there. If we read that same file, we can tell you can actually load a file to any location in memory you like. So you see it still shows you the original load address of C1000, which is built into the file, but then it tells you it finished loading at C105, and you can imply that just did what you said about starting at C1, C100. And now if we do a listing at C100, you'll see our program is in that location as well. Now that we're done with those test files, let's do a greater than symbol, quote, and the S scratch command with a wildcard, the star, and that should get rid of 
both test and test one. Okay, there it tells us that it scratched two files. Those files are gone. Okay, there's also the up arrow command, which instead of showing a hex dump of memory at that location, it shows the Petsky representation. And here we've disassembled part of the C64 basic ROM. And we can see the code right here that this is CBM basic. And that's just a little ID that they embedded in the ROM. I'm only showing that just as a quick example. And there's also that base conversion built in. Like if we type an address like C1000 and they put equals at the end, it'll show the same value in decimal, the number sign for decimal, and a binary representation of it, all 16 bits. And then it shows a Petsky representation, I believe, of the low byte. So that's just an at symbol. So that's handy. You can also do, if you use that number sign, you can do a decimal conversion, like what is 32768? Oh, what is 37628? I forgot the equal sign. There, that's the same as 8000 hex. And you see it's a very tidy binary number. Now you might think that you can also use a dollar sign or a percent sign. It shows them right here. But you'd be kind of wrong. Dollar sign 8000 equals. <laughs> it'll actually show a directory and then it'll display what 8000 hex is. <laughs> and even worse, if you type a binary number like, well, for example, you just do something simple like 4, it shows you that the binary representation of it is 100 with a percent sign in front. So you might think you could do percent sign 100 equals, but nope, the percent sign quits the monitor. Okay, so that's many, not all the functions in the fast load cartridge, but I think that's enough for you to play around with. You should be able to find a fast load ROM image uh, online somewhere if you just want to play around with this in an emulator. If you have a real computer, but you don't have any cartridge for it, if you do find a fast load cartridge, it's way better than nothing. There are more powerful options, but they're also more expensive. So if you pick up that fast load reloaded or an original fast load, it's a valuable thing to have. And it does a lot more than a lot of people think. Thank you again for, to everybody who subscribed and liked the videos and all the comments I'm getting. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.